We're continuing on our core values. Um, I think this should be part three, the law of generosity. That's what I'm gonna be preaching on today. The law of what? Of generosity. If you're writing notes, please take out your notes. Glory to God. The law of generosity. The law of generosity. Take me up twice, please. When were you born? When were you born? 2000 and what? Eh? 1999. Okay, at least there's a bit of hope. Amen. Go up again, please. Second Corinthians chapter nine, the book of Second Corinthians chapter nine. Yeah, please occupy those seats. And I have a good time in the Word of God. I want to teach this. I might not finish it because of time, uh, but I will do the best that I can. Um, I don't want to rush through it either, because I believe that this is going to help someone. Uh, Please, whoever's fiddling with my mic, don't do that at all, at all, at all. The elders and angels bow. You know that song? You don't know the song? 2000. Can we be generous? Just impart grace. Just, just. Just extend his knowledge. Just, just lift up your hand, stretch it towards the piano. We we'll release grace for ancient songs. Amen. The law of generosity. Second Corinthians chapter nine from verse six. Let me come down here. Can we all see it? I've got it here in two translations from the Passion translation as well as the Message translation. So I'm gonna do my best to read both. It's quite a long read from verse 6 to verse 14. Here's my point. A stingy sower will do what? Will reap a meager harvest. But the one who sows from a generous spirit will reap an abundant harvest. Next verse. Let giving flow from your heart, not from a sense of religious duty. Let it spring freely from the joy of giving. All because, why? God loves hilarious generosity. Wow, I feel like um, an English student right now. Hilarious generosity. I think I was struggling with uh, word palpitations the other day. Yes, God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than en enough of everything. Amen? More than enough of how many things? Yeah. Everything. Now, you didn't ask for everything, but God wants you to have more than enough of how many things? Yeah. Of everything. Joy included. Health included. Peace included. Job included. Increase included. Money included. Everything God wants you to have more than enough. He doesn't want you to just get by. He wants you to do what? To have more than enough of how many things? Of everything. Amen. Every moment in every way, not sometimes. It's one thing to have a great season and have a bad season. Amen. But God says every moment and in every way, he will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. God is saying that in every good thing you do, you will do it abundantly. Amen. It will be overflow. You will be overflowing with abundance of every good thing you do. Verse 9. Just as the scripture says about the one who trusts in him, because he has sown extravagantly and given to the poor, his kindness and generous deeds will never be what? Will never be forgotten. 
Every seed that you have sown in your life, God has not forgotten about it. Amen. Every act of generosity and kindness that you have shown to strangers out there, God has not forgotten about it. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 10. This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, he is more extravagant toward you. First, he supplies every need, plus what? Oh, come on, I wish you were reading with me. Are you, are you seeing this on the screen? He supplies every need plus what? He supplies every need plus? So you ask him for bread and he gives you more than just what you asked for. You ask him for a job. God, can I just get a job? And he makes you the CEO. You ask for a job, he gives you a business. That's what I mean. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And then he says, then he multiplies the seed as you sow it, so that the harvest of your generosity will do what? Will grow. So God is so interested in you growing because he knows that that will encourage you to do more. He knows that the more he multiplies your seed, the more you grow. And the more excited you get. I don't know about you, but I get excited every time God does something for me. It's nice, isn't it? You give something and then God just poof, slaps you with a blessing in the morning. God just solves your problem. Glory to God. Verse 11. You will be abundantly enriched in every way as you give generously on every occasion. For when we take your gifts to those in need, it causes many to give thanks to God. That is the power of your generosity. People begin to thank God. Oh, thank God for supplying money. You buy someone a beggar uh, on the street. They start worshiping God. How God just supplied my need. I was hungry and now I've got something to eat. Glory to God. All because you were generous. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 12. It says, the priestly ministry you are providing through your offering not only supplies what is lacking for God's people, it inspires an outpouring of praises and thanksgiving to God himself. I love this man. You know, this scripture is preaching all by itself. The Bible says that your giving is a priestly ministry. Giving is a what? It's a priestly ministry. It is a prophetic revelatory uh, of the magnitude and the streams overflowing, you know, in the abundant system of the apocalypse. <laughs> it, but it is a priestly ministry. Whoa! So giving. When you give, the Bible says you're a priest. God bless you. I just, I just performed a priestly ministry. Okay, he's holding on to the money <laughs> tightly. <you know? laughs> Hallelujah. Verse 13. For as, you, as your extremely generous offerings meet the approval of those in Jerusalem, it will cause them to give glory to God, all because your loyal support and allegiance to the gospel of Christ as well as your generous-hearted partnership with them towards those in need. Verse 14. Because of your extra... Listen, it's, this thing just keeps growing and growing. Because of this extraordinary grace which God has lavished on you, they will affectionately remember you in their prayers. Affectionately, not just God bless Fafa. They will intercede for you. Because of your generosity, some of you are overcoming challenges that you don't, you, you, have, you, you didn't pray the whole week. But you did not succumb to the pressure. Why? Because there is someone, somewhere, that says, God bless that lady. Help her. Strengthen her. And in all the nonsense that you went through, you are still standing. Why? because of generosity. The Bible says that it will cause men to affectionately pray for you. Hallelujah. 
it causes man to do what? Yeah, pray, remember you in their prayers. Put it up in the message translation. So generosity is the ability to give beyond the call of duty. It is what? The ability to give beyond the call of duty. It is the ability to give more than what is required. Hallelujah. It is giving more than what is asked for. So the Bible calls our seed bread for the needy. It says that when we bring seed, God turns it into bread for the needy. For you with a seed, to the needy it is bread, it is life, it is a supply, it is manna from heaven. They don't understand where it came from. Hallelujah. That's what your seed is. You see it as 10 rand to someone else, it is a loaf of bread. Hallelujah. Let's look at tithing for a minute as a spiritual law. Now, there's a difference in the laws. There's the law of Moses and there are spiritual, universal spiritual laws. These are not your thou shall not. This is what makes the earth rotate. These are, these are, are truth, unfailing ancient truth. And, and tithing is one of them. So in Malachi chapter three, where God asks for the offering, I just wanna explain this so that we, we understand the need for, the, for, for, tithe, for you to tithe. But that's not where I want to dwell today. I want us to go beyond that. But the issue with tithing is that tithing is a base. It became a law because God is looking for a way to channel resources into your life. And without giving, God can't bring anything in. You have to be a giver to be a receiver. So God put a law and he says that, listen, I know you are stingy, at least bring 10% so that I can open the heavens and give you something. You need to give me something to work with. Do you understand where, it, where it's coming from? God says that if you give it to me, at least you are in trouble. So the, the devourer is devouring. The debts are debting. The issues are issuing. So bring me 10% of what you are earning, of what I am giving you. In that way, for your sake, I will rebuke the devourer. Because he says that because the universal law is that he loves a cheerful giver, where we read. Because some of you are already religious, you're already thinking about it, but the Bible just said, don't give out of religious compulsion. So it was not a religious compulsion, it was a setup for your blessing. Because God can't open the heavens over someone that is stingy. So he says, let us work with the, with the foundation now. Let me, give you a, let me give you a platform. Let me help you out. Instead of you being generous because you are struggling with that one, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you now what generosity does. He says, because you are struggling with giving, at least let's partner. Give me 10% and keep 90. In that way, I will be able to do something for you. Because you are praying and you are crying, God bless me, but there is nothing moving. Why? Because you are not a giver. Do, do, do you see this thing? So it's not a law to say you are doing it religious. Listen, for me, even if it was a religious law, if it works for my advantage, I might as well do it. Why refuse something that makes you uncomfortable simply, it may, simply because it makes you uncomfortable, but you can see the results? It's like staying faithful. It's not nice for some people, but it gives you results. Coming to church is not always fun, but it gives you results. You understand? So tithing is what? It is a spiritual law that helps you, that helps you receive from God. 
Hallelujah. So it initiates the process of working or partnering with God. That's what tithing does. It becomes a base. This is the bare minimum requirement for the Lord that the Lord requires in order for him to put something in your hands, in your family, in your house. It is the bare minimum requirement. It is a setup for our sake. God knew that if, if only left to us, a lot of us would suffer and die. If God were to say that it is just up to you to do it, you would struggle a lot. So he says that, listen, before you get to the generous part, because most people are, are sticking on that, God loves a cheerful giver, but you are not a cheerful giver. So be, because you are not yet there, do the minimum. So that when you see God answer you with the bare minimum, you will be excited to do more. Then the generosity kicks in because it needs to come as a revelation. Anything you do for God and it's not a revelation from Him, you will quit. It has to come as a revelation. So God says that if you bring me the 10%, that's the bare minimum, then we've got something to work with. Then I will multiply that seed sown. I will open the heavens over you. I will pour out a blessing. You won't have enough room to, uh, 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 to contain it. And then what's going to happen, you're going to start being generous with it. Now that's where generous abundance, abundant giving comes in. Because God has poured out from heaven, hallelujah. So in, the, so in the core or law of generosity, we go beyond the minimum requirement, which is the tithing. When we say that we are generous givers, it means that we go beyond the call of duty. We go beyond the bare minimum. That's why Jesus says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. These are eternal truths. And Basalana, listen, you can, you, can, you can argue with it all you like. In fact, you don't have to do it. Because you see, one thing I love about God, He never forces anyone to even get saved. So a person can refuse to change and be a sinner and die a sinner. And guess what? God still loves you in that condition. Do you know that? Yeah, a liar, God loves them. Unrepentant in their ways, God still loves you. But it does not mean that because God is not doing anything about it, then the universe is not responding to it. You are busy reaping a harvest. Hallelujah. Now let's look at this, what I've titled Next Level Giving. Number one, Next Level Giving, this is generous giving. You give with the same excitement God gives you with. The same way. For God so loved the world that he did what? Ooh, he gave. You give with the same intensity. Generous giving means giving to the poor, partnering with the work of God, putting others' needs before yours. This is what I call the wealthy place giving. This is not for everybody. This is for those that are looking to get to their wealthy place. This is not from, as for me and my house. This is as for me and my generation. When you, when, when you are no longer thinking about, about a puzzle shop, you think of a supermarket, not because you want to make more money, but also the money is good, but also because you want to employ people. It worries you when you watch the news and they give you the statistics of unemployment in South Africa. It must make your, your tummy turn, yeah. It must do something to you. Why? Because you're somebody that is generous. So now that the bare minimum is met, this is the time where we begin to create wealth. This is where we multiply. This is where we replenish the earth, hallelujah. So this is the kind of giving, next level giving, generous giving. This is the kind of giving that makes you a conduit through which the blessings of God are distributed. 
Oh, I refuse to be the one to ask people to give to me. I want to be the one people come to when they're looking for something. I want to be a transporter. I want to be that boat. I want to be that ship that God uses to bring things into your home. Hallelujah. I want to be the one that can pay my friend's rent. I want to be the one that when I go out with my friends, I pay the bill. Why? Because I understand that blessed is the hand that gives, the one that's always taking. It's not always a good thing, but my, my, my friend, for you to be taking from people all the time. Ask yourself, why are you always taking? Sometimes it's not even God giving you. It's the guy activating a spiritual law. So he's using you. <laughs> He's using you as an experiment. God, I'm going to give to this one. Let me get my harvest. And he keeps on doing it. And you wonder, why does this guy always, and you are happy, you think you, 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 think you are sucking them dry. You can't suck a blessed man dry. You, it's impossible. The more you take, the more they gain. Hallelujah. You understand? It is a law. And some people have mastered this law. They can't sit without giving. A week does not go by without them being a blessing to someone. And I'm not just talking about church. Amen? I'm so passionate about this because this is how we break the back of poverty from our black communities. Amen. We're not going to raise a church that's going to depend on the government to come and build us anything. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to give our way out of poverty. Why? Blessed is the hand that gives than the one that receives. That's why the Muslims that you are begging to keep giving you. Why? Because the law applies whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. So you are, you are, you, you, you are a system that the unbeliever is using to get blessed. And the one in the kingdom does not understand how the system works. And that's why you stay poor. I don't mean you. I know you are abundant, exceeding abundantly, running over in the bosom of shaking. Amen. Glory to God. I want us to look at, listen, maybe one more point there. God says that those who participate in the next level giving are abundantly supplied with everything needed. We read this in the scripture. For every season, for every season, you are abundantly supplied. Every season. Hi, we are shy, Nanji. So what you wouldn't allow, we are known now and I. Why? Every season, I am abundantly blessed. Somebody say that I'm abundantly blessed. Ah. And it also attracts intercessory prayers. Those of you who are running and you're looking for prophets to pray for you, I just gave you the answer. You can have the entire community praying for you. You can have your entire family praying for you. You can have the entire church praying for you by being a generous giver. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Giving in the house of the Lord. Ways to give to the king. Enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. What does it mean? Every single time, Herbert, you come into the house of the Lord. Listen, I know you are going through stuff, and God also knows. The reason why you have remained there is because we are breaking that scripture. Enter with thanksgiving. Amen? You don't just come into people's houses. No, no, we are, we are all They've got enough sense to say there's a vulam lom. They don't open the gate until you holler some praises and, and bring a gift. While at the door, before you come into the presence and tell us why you are here, there's a vulam lom. You understand? So when you walk in through the gates of your church, have your vulam lom ready. Gratitude in your heart. God, I am back again. What an honor. What a privilege for me to be in your presence. Hallelujah. You are smiling. You are happy from the, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And like I love saying, don't just come to church and all you are spotting is enemies in the church. 
people who are not here for God, you are, you are a sin detector. Uh, uh, relax. Enter with thanksgiving. Thank God for the ones that are there. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. When you wake up in the morning, because he is omnipresent, when you wake up in the morning, it's not a complaint you speak first. Thank God I am awake. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Amen. This thanksgiving for Esther was three days of praying and fasting. Before she could come to the king, she needed to prepare herself. I think the come as you are scripture, if I could, I would edit it out. Because <laughs> some people just come. Gee, they are marching to Zion. Amen. But she prepared. Number two, you bring a gift. You bring a gift. Proverbs 18 and verse 16, the message translation. A gift gets attention. It buys the attention of eminent people. A gift. This is the one that everyone says a man's gift shall make room for him and shall make you stand before great men. It doesn't mean you're dancing, by the way. It means a literal gift. Please put up the scripture. It means a literal gift. Your gift, what you come bearing. Now, if they are looking for dancers, then that's the gift that's required. It will make, it will open room for you. Because, sir, you can't go to parliament and, 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 what song were you singing today? Yeah, Itembalam. You understand? If you meet with the president, it's not Itembalami that's going to get you there. There's another side of you that they are looking for that will get him to enter. But if you go to Universal, they are looking for Itembalam. So what do Christians do? We mix match, mix masala, we, we, we dance where we are supposed to be praying, we shout where we are supposed to be quiet, we are standing where we are supposed to be sitting. All in the name of, uh, don't, don't stop my praise. You don't walk into a library and start singing. It's not the place. It's not the right time. So you must understand who you are coming to so that your gift will be appropriate. You can't come to my house and you bring me a bottle of whiskey. You know good and well I'm a pastor. Oh, I didn't say I don't drink, I said I'm a pastor. <laughs> but I didn't say I drink either. But what I'm saying is, your gift will show me how much you honor me or disrespect me. So you need to know the appropriate thing to buy for the appropriate people, to bring for the appropriate people. And so when you go apply for a job as an engineer, your gift is not a medical certificate. Your gift is an engineering degree. You need to understand. Amen? And so it's not the size of the gift. It is the size of the honor. It can be a small little thing. It can be, it can be this thing right here. This small little thing. But given from a generous spirit, from an honoring heart, Men of God, I just, I, I saw this and I just thought about you. God bless you. My brother, I just saw this and I thought, man, I didn't want to come see you empty-handed. Here we go. It is not in the size of the gift. It is the size of the heart giving the gift. Amen. So measure yourself accordingly. Amen? Amen? And what determines honor is the level of sacrifice. It's the level of sacrifice. Like I said, I don't think I'm going to finish this today. I'll continue with it next week. Number three, prepare it before you come. When you come to church, you prepare your gift before coming. Listen, because of your relationship with God, already you know that in the service, there is a segment for giving. So you prepare. You, we don't even have to have a, a script and a 30-minute sermon about giving. Why? You are prepared for it. I am going to meet the king. 
It's like a man going to pay Lobola without money. So when I get there, I'll pray in tongues. If they talk nicely, I might just pull out a hundred rand note. No, you prepare. You take your time. I am meeting with the king. You are prepared for that meeting. Hallelujah. This is 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse, verse 6 and 7. I want each of you, this is a message translation, to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your mind as to what you will give. Make up your mind every single Sunday. Don't let this be something that you do religiously like what the Bible was warning us about. That's why God was specific about the 10%. You prepare when you leave home. And God knows you don't have a hundred rand. He knows all you have is five rand, but prepare it. When, while you are preparing your makeup to come to church, you put your offering on the side as well. My offering, check. Shoes, check. Dance moves, check. Everything I need for today to be a good service, check. You come up with your own checklist. Don't be spontaneous all the time. Plan your own success. Hallelujah. Success is deliberate, Bazalwan. Growth is something that is very deliberate. You plan for it. Number three, give it cheerfully. Give it cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's look at a lesson from King Solomon on giving to God. Second Kings chapter three, Verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father, David, except that Solomon too offered sacrifice and burnt incense at the local places of worship. He's a king and he goes to a local place of worship to give his own offering to God because this thing is personal. He says, the most important of these places of worship was Goshen. So the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, what do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. What do you want? As a king, the Bible says that he, 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 he burnt a thousand bulls. In verse 3, the Bible tells us that he loved the Lord. So what prompted the burning of this offering? His love for God. Amen? He loved, so he gave. He gave his sacrifice at a local place of worship. But he was giving it to God, but he gave it at a designated place of worship. This was before the, the temple was dedicated. Amen? And so his offering is what brought him the wisdom he asked for from God. There's an offering that you can give that catches the attention of God. Did we not just read it in Proverbs? That your gift will catch the attention of eminent people. And this is what Solomon is doing. His gift catches the attention of God. God wasted no time to respond. Same night, God appeared. What does that teach us? You cannot outgive God. The same night, God appeared to him in a dream and he said, ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. Glory to Jesus. Second Chronicles chapter 7, again, we're still busy with King Solomon. Chapter 7, verse 4 to six. Then the king and all Israel worshipped, offering sacrifices to God. King Solomon worshipped by sacrificing 22,000 cattle. <laughs> and 120,000 sheep at the dedication of the temple. The priests were all on duty. The choir and orchestra of Levites that David had provided for singing and playing anthems to the praise and love of God were all there. 
Across the country, yard, the priests blew the trumpet. All Israel, all Israelites were on their feet. So giving, as we can see, as we can see here, it is a form of worship. The Bible specifically says that Solomon worshipped God by giving 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep. He was worshipping God. That's why I said to us that we need to make sure that our gift to God is appropriate. Know what to give, when to give it, how to give it. It takes revelation, it takes relationship. What gave him the audacity to do this? Because the, the previous scripture we read, he gave 1,000. When he saw the response of God, he took it a level higher. Somebody say, abundant giving. Yeah, God wants you to be generous. So because he saw the response, same time God responded. Even here, God still responded. God came down into the temple. And he says, yes, I accept your offering. Yes, I am pleased with what you are giving. He came down himself. Didn't send angels. It was not an angelic encounter. Hallelujah. Listen, if, what I'm learning from Solomon is that if you're going to give something to God, give him your best. Do you know that God didn't have any problem with Cain? The problem was what he gave, not him. It was the attitude with which he gave to God. He was, his offering was condescending. He, he looked at everything and he said, let me give him the, these shriveled ones. And God says, I delight in cheerful givers. And so that's what caused animosity between Cain and God. Hallelujah. So God's reaction to Cain was a result of stingy giving. Lessons we can learn from the Queen of Sheba. 1 Kings chapter 10 and verse 10. Then she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold, great quantities of spices and precious jewels. Never again were so many spices brought in as those the queen of Sheba gave to the king, to King Solomon. In addition, Haram's sheep brought gold of offer and they also brought rich cargoes of red sandalwood and precious jewels jump over to verse 13 King Solomon gave the queen of Sheba whatever she asked for besides all the customary gifts he had so generously given then she and all her attendants returned to their own land now we can see that this lady came prepared to meet with a king now she had heard stories of how wealthy he was and this is the mistake that a lot of people make when they've got great and wealthy mentors whenever you meet your mentors you don't bring a gift you've never bought them. you've never sent them a message on their birthday you are stingy even with data just whatsapp message to say chief happy birthday you see but she came prepared. She heard that this guy, there is no one as wealthy as he is. But she prepared a, an offering for the king. And she went there and they opened and she had audience with the king. When you read verse 13, it tells us that Solomon in turn gave to her generously and sent her away. What does this tell us? Giving to a king attracts the wealth of the king. That's why when you apply for credit, they check your credit score. Because some of us have got bad credit records. You are not a giver. So when you go to God, God, give me. They check your credit score and say, ah, debit order of note. Amen. She gave her best. Giving to a, to a king grants you access to the wealth of the king. If you want good people to give to you, start giving to good people. 
I can tell you now, the reason why, listen, when you make yourself a victim all the time and people feel sorry for you, then all they will do is to buy you McDonald's. No one will trust you with true riches. No one will trust you with opportunities. Why? Because of the way you present yourself. This woman opened Solomon's vault. Her generosity bought the respect of Solomon. Her preparedness bought the heart of the king. Hallelujah. And so the next time you go for a great meeting, you are meeting someone in a private place, make sure you do something for them. Bring a gift. Offer to pay lunch. When you are meeting with people that can change your life, offer to pay the bill. Tell them, say, no, it's okay. I, I've got this one covered. And you know your, uh, your account is bleeding the blood. Just make sure you don't go to complicate. Go to Kauai where they will just order coffee or a smoothie. Then you, you are prepared. You've got your 500 rands in your pocket. You know, there's no way that they'll eat more than 500 rands. They'll just get a wrap and a Coke. You understand? But you offer to pay the bill. What are you doing? When you do that, you unlock their vault. You unlock their vault. And this is what this queen did. She was smart. She was smart. So being stingy shuts the door of the king's vaults. There are people that can give you jobs, but your approach is wrong. There are people that can open doors for you. But some of our approach, we are still too raw. We need to be refined. We need to fix our mannerisms. There are people, Ali, that you don't joke with. I know I'm talking about giving. What does that have to do with joke? I'm talking about conduct when you give to a king. Hallelujah. Lessons we can learn from Cornelius. Acts chapter 10. The Bible tells us that this guy, one day he had a vision. And an angel came to him, and the angel says, your prayers and your generous gifts to the poor have come up as a sacrifice to God and have been remembered by him. How many of us are professionals here? You're a doctor or you're in the medical field. Lift up your hand, let me see. People in the medical field? In the medical, who else? Only one. Oh, there's another one. Nurses, medical field, anything that is to do with medical, you can poke people with an injection. <laughs> you are allowed to do that. Okay. Okay, thank you. And how many engineers do we have? Engineers, electrical, whatever, engineering, mechanical, or complicated engineering, amen? <laughs> Some of you, the, the, the things you mentioned are very mind-blowing. Now, the Bible says that this guy is giving to the poor. And this is where the church misses it. This guy is giving to the poor. Earned him an audience with God. It earned him an audience with who? With God. There are things that you can do as a medical doctor where we can come together as a church and say that this entire community, we've got old age homes, we've got children's homes, and we open this place up during the week and we say, let the goggles come for free medical examinations. We are doing what? We are giving to the poor. We are now transacting with God. It is beyond what, can, what am I gaining? It is now what am I doing for God? Hallelujah. We can get to a point whereby we, we, we come up with a system as a church that those that are skilled in certain professions, we look for gogos that are living on their own and we go fix their homes. Plumbers, where are you? We go fix leaking pipes in, in the old age home. Why? We are transacting with God. We go beyond the call of duty. It is not enough to be a prayer warrior. This guy said, the angel says that your prayer and your generosity, generosity and prayer, prayer and generosity have come up to God. That's why prayer warriors are not blessed. And givers that don't pray are depressed. Sure. 
You understand? It's a combination. So why, I'm going to ask this question, and this is where I'm going to close. Actually, I'm finished with my message. Wow. Why do the poor remain poor and the rich become richer? I've heard it in songs. I've seen it on social media. I've, it's a norm. It's a trend. It's something that is there. You know that, right? The poor keep getting poorer and the rich keep getting richer. Have you noticed it? Yeah. This guy was a millionaire. Now he has become a billionaire. Now he's in the top five richest people in the world. Then he drops to top seven. Then he goes back to top one. Why is that happening? And the one that was broke, your story is not, in fact, it's not even worth talking about because who are we going to tell? There's a reason why. Funny as it may sound, but there's a reason why. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 5. There is another evil I have seen under the sun. Kings and rulers make a grave mistake. When they, when they give great authority, when they give great authority to foolish people and low positions to, to people of proven worth. I have seen servants riding horseback while princes and princesses walking like servants. The Bible tells us here that, you, you know what is a fool? A fool is a person who disregards rules. That's what a fool is. Because one plus one is two. If you miss that rule, especially deliberately, then you're an idiot. It's not about how smart you are. It's about how well can you follow rules. Amen? So a fool is a person who despises rules. So the Bible says that putting a person like that in places of leadership, it will make the people suffer. It says when, when fools rule, the people will suffer. Now, what we are seeing in verse 7 is what's happening in our societies. Where, where princes, you and I, children of God, we are walking barefoot and servants are riding on horsebacks. Meaning that the poor, the people in the church are poor and struggling and unbelievers are doing well and we envy them then we as Christians we start saying stuff like you don't have to be a Christian to be rich you are right you don't have to be you didn't come to church to be rich you came to serve God you came to be trained for your own work of ministry so that your, your gift will be utilized out there for the kingdom that's why you come to church it's a college church is not a it's a college you come here to be trained Amen. So he says that servants are riding. Princes and princesses are walking. Oh, but God is going to change that for us today. Amen. Amen. Luke 16, verse 8. The rich man had to admire the dishonest rascal for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of the light. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then when your possessions are gone, they will come to you. They will, co they will come to you an eternal home. Amen? Now, what we read in Ecclesiastes is a problem of working the system whereby believers don't know how to work the system that they live under. And so because unbelievers understand the law of generosity, they are riding and we are walking. Muslims understand the law of generosity, so they ride, we walk. Hallelujah. Corporates understand. That's why they've got uh, 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 CSI programs. Because they understand that even the government will give them money when they take care of the poor. 
Why do pedophiles open uh, uh, all these NGOs and do children trafficking, sex trafficking of kids? And the government is funding them. Obviously, they'll be pretending as if they're doing good, but they're doing damage. And the government funds them. But Tina, with our noble cause of building the Lord's house, there is no bank that will give a church money to build a church. But they are given to unbelievers with a vision and a plan to look after the poor. You understand? Generosity is what attracts the wealth and the resources of a nation. If you want to get off your feet and jump on a horse, you need to change your giving patterns. If you want to go from unemployed, uh, unemployed to employed, you need to change the way you, you see giving. Amen? You need to change the way you see giving. So servants will rule because they understand the system better than the princes. No matter how much smart you think you are, if you can't play the money game, and I'm going to call it that just for contemporary language use, if you can't play the money game, you will never win it. You need to know that the only way that you will increase financially is through giving. It's not just hard work, it is also through giving. Hallelujah. So part of this system is generous giving. Like I said, verse 9 tells us that generous people don't stay down for too long. The Bible says that when you have money, use your earthly resources to make friends. Be a giver. So that when you are down, they will lift you up. It's quicker to bounce back when you've got friends. But when you're a stingy person, everyone can't wait for you to fall. Hallelujah. Everyone can't wait for you to fall. And in closing, I want to tie this to the Good Samaritan. My oh God, please get me my towel. Luke chapter 10 and verse 30. Jesus replied, There was once a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. When bandits robbed him along the way, they beat him severely, stripped, stripped him naked. The, the water, yeah. Give me the water as well, thank you. They beat him severely, stripped him naked, and left him half dead. Soon, a Jewish priest, look at this. What is the Jewish priest doing? Soon, a Jewish, a Jewish priest, what was he doing? Yeah, he was doing what? I want us to highlight the word walking. Isn't it? That's what we read in Ecclesiastes. He's a priest and he's doing what? Walking. Someone say systems. He's walking. All right. Soon a Jewish priest walking down the same road came upon the wounded man. Seeing him from a distance, the priest crossed to the other side of the road and walked right past. He kept walking. The walkers will keep walking. He kept walking. And then in verse 32, later a religious man, a Levite, these are the people, these are your worshippers, your ushers, the priests that were doing all the, uh, 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 the work in the, in, in, in the temple of God, in the place of worship. He came doing what? How? The priest is walking. Those that are doing priestly duties in the temple are also what? Walking. And in their walking, they walk past this guy. Now we would have assumed that they were supposed to do something about this. These are priests, by the way. These are supposed to be good people. These are supposed to be generous people. These are supposed to be givers. They should be understanding the law of generosity. But you can see the reason why they are walking. Because even when they are supposed to help someone, they can't. So why will they write anything if they, are, if they are stingy? Why is God going to bless them if they can walk past a wounded man? Now look at an unbeliever. Finally, another man, a Samaritan, came upon the bleeding man and was moved with tender compassion for him. 
He stooped down. That tells you that he was on something. The princes and the princesses, tongue-talking, fire-baptized, are walking. And then an unbeliever stooped down. That tells you that he was on something. He came down. And he started, he, 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 he worked on this guy, he, he, uh, bandaging uh, them to stop the bleeding, lifting him up. He placed him on his own donkey. The other ones probably they couldn't even help because they didn't even have a donkey. But at least they could have prayed for him. At least they could have waited for someone with the resources to come, sit there and wait with him, give him some water or something. They could have done that, but they didn't. And this is what has kept our people low. They are not generous. We walk past and we laugh at people that are struggling in the church. A sister walks in here with something funny on. Instead of helping, we laugh and we walk past. And that's why we will keep walking. But today we can change the story. Today we can change our attitude. Hallelujah. We can change. And the Bible tells us in verse 35 that the next morning, he took his own money from his wallet and gave it to the innkeeper. With these words, take care of him until I come back from my journey. If it costs more than this, I will repay when I return. What does this tell you? This guy had a good reputation. The innkeeper could trust him. Hallelujah. Some of us, we have mismanaged our, our resources so bad that banks can't trust us with a home. You have mismanaged your credit so bad. Everyone you've borrowed money from in church, in fact, you are now sitting by the door because you are ready when Mfundi says amen, you just want to quickly sneak out. What? You are untrustworthy. And if you can't be trusted with small things, how will God give you the true riches of the kingdom? Hallelujah. The man was a trustworthy guy. His word was his bond. So there's a reason why the priest was walking. The Levite was walking. There's a reason. And back to the tithing issue. That's what corporates use. We call it tithe in the kingdom. Corporates put up a specific percentage of their money and say this is to look after the poor. They take care of communities. So Tina, as a church, what are we doing as a CSI program? Our community must be the one to defend the church, not ourselves. That's why I asked for the professionals. Because we have got to make an impact in the community where God has planted us. We have to make the place better. They have to think about the church and say, that church changed my life. Whether they are coming or they are not, it doesn't matter. We, we don't have any seats right now anyways. But that does not mean that we chuck them aside and we become a nuisance. We become a blessing. Learn, church of God, to be a blessing. Let the professionals take out a day, one in a month, take out a day where you can go do some charity work on your own without CNN following you. And it is between you and God. You are transacting with God. I've heard people saying, I, I'm trusting God for a hospital. But you, listen, you're a doctor right now. Who are you helping? Except the ones that are paying you. You understand what I mean? The priest could have done something, but probably was rushing to come and preach. And sometimes we walk past people and we think we are serving God. But there's a law, the law of generosity. If you want to unlock the heavens over your life, start now. Be a blessing at the level at which God has placed you. Be a blessing in your community. Be known for generous work. Hallelujah. When you buy salt and you know that, in, you know, Elokshin is in you buy extra for those that are coming to ask. You buy everything you have. There is something that you have that you can give to someone. 
So the reason why, the answer to the question, why do the poor remain poor and the rich keep getting richer, is because rich people have got CSI programs and poor people are their CSI program. Oh, I refuse to be anybody's project. I refuse with every sense of humility in me. I refuse to be a project. That when they are looking to dump uh, 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 leftover food, they must come to my house. No, I refuse. I'd rather go hungry. I need to find an opportunity to be a blessing to someone. No matter what I have, five friends, share it with someone. What are you doing? You are planting a seed. That five friends to you is a seed. To someone else, it is bread. Refuse, Mzalwan. Unga vumi ukuba iskep seli sabanya bantu. Unga vumi ukuba integi sayabanya bazalwan. Every single time they they give you stuff, we say bring some clothes so that we can be a blessing. They bring something that is torn somewhere or that there has never been worn since 1999. No, when you're gonna give to God, give your best. Give your best. And this is how you learn to receive, by giving. Hallelujah. By doing what? By giving. You can change your story. You can change your story. Giving to a king opens the vault of the king. That's why during COVID they could shut down churches and open shabins. They were looking at the tax value. What value are we adding versus the beer? They are looking at it from an economic point of view. What role does the church play economically? And my prayer is that each and every one of us here, we will be planted like soldiers in all sectors of government. They will find someone from, 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 from the body of Christ, from specifically from this church. Find us there, planted. You are not here to be my fans. You are here to just get what you need to get and go out there and do the work. Yeah. Anybody that comes to me and says, Mfuni, release me, I will quick. That's why the harvest is plentiful. We are not fighting. This is not a war thing between preachers and, and, and their sons. No. Yeah. Someone comes and says, God has called me. I release you quick. Go start. Go start. Because we need to win souls. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Somebody say, I'm a generous giver. I'm a generous. Hallelujah. So we're going to pray in two minutes, then we're going to go home. But I want you to take this and make it practical. Please be generous. We're going to pray for the spirit of generosity, that God will help you to be a giver, to be a seed sower. And why? Not because the house has need, so that you may become a conduit through which the blessing will be distributed. Amen. God wants you to be wealthy. God wants you to be healthy. Why? So that he can use you. It is a setup. Look at your neighbor and tell him it's a setup. Yeah. God wants you to do better. Why? It's a setup. It's for his kingdom's sake. God wants you to be blessed. Why? It's a setup. Because he's got people that are struggling out there and you will not be one of them this year. In the name of Jesus. Come on, say, I'm not one of them. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I will give and lend to the nations. Oh, hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Come on, lift up those hands. Just ask him for that grace. Father, thank you. Now pray for grace to be a giver. Grace to be a seed So I will not be a beggar. In 2024, I refuse to be a beggar. I refuse to live on other people's terms. In the mighty name of Jesus. Oh God, you promised that you will give me abundantly. The Lord, you will bless me for every season. In the name of Jesus. Come on, just lift up that prayer. Give me grace, oh God, for abundant living. Give me grace, oh God, for generous giving. Give me grace, oh God. I will not form part of the statistics of poor people keep getting poorer. 
In the name of Jesus, I will be lifted up in this season. I will be lifted up in this season. When people are looking for breakthroughs, may they come looking for your company. When people are looking for, your, for jobs, may they come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. May you be a vehicle that God uses to bless his people. May you be a vehicle that God uses to bless his people. In the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, just pray, church of God. God, anoint me with the spirit of generosity. Lord, anoint me with the spirit of giving. Lord, anoint me to be a giver, to be generous in all seasons of life. Anoint me to be a giver, not just in your house, but in society. To be a giver, not just in this house, oh God, but in society, to my neighbors, oh God. In the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everybody. Listen, we can come here Sunday in, Sunday out, and make chants all we like, and shout and scream and roll on the floor all we like, but unless we deal with the serious issues that will get our people out of poverty and struggle, then we have not had church. Hallelujah. God wants you to be generous so that he can give more to you. God wants you to be wealthy so that you can help people out there. Amen. May God use you in this season. Sincerely, my prayer is that God will use you. It doesn't matter whether you're in varsity, you can be in varsity and be a millionaire. Hallelujah. You can, you can be a general worker and have so much work that that skill changes and becomes a company and a business where you get other general workers and you send them out to work for you. Hallelujah. That's how some of these big companies were born. You can open and own your own factory. Why? Because there are people that need jobs. It's not just about you and I, Bazalwan. Hallelujah. My prayer is that God will help pastors build bigger churches so that they can train the people in the truth of the kingdom so that these people can go and impact their generation. Hallelujah. We are winning in 2024. Yeah. Glory to God. We are moving forward in 2024. May the grace of, of the good Samaritan come upon you. May you never walk, but continue to ride. May you ride forward, hallelujah. May you ride greatly, hallelujah. May you be the head and not the tail. Hallelujah, you are blessed forever. You are blessed forever, glory to God.